Hello everybody and welcome to my video on this, the Goers Box Tangor 6x9, which we can tell because it says Box Tangor on the top there. And uh, I think, it, yeah, it says Goers, Goers Front Tour, <laughs> not my night, Goers Frontar on the um, lens, kind of worn off there. But then it does not say Zeiss on it anywhere, which means we know that this is in fact the Goers made version of the Tangor because it predates when Zeiss was mar making these. Basically, the dime store history of Goers is that they were bought by Zeiss and Zeiss took over the Tangor line when that happened. This is a 120 film format, which means yes, it can use modern 120 films. Six by nine camera. The six by nine is the size of the negative, six centimeters by nine centimeters. It's a very large negative. We'll just open up the camera right here, and you can see this is the size of the negative inside of the camera. So, very, very large images out of this guy. Has no light meter, no flash sync at all. It has a leaf shutter with shutter speeds of time and around 1 30th of a second. Time basically is you flip the, the, the shutter, it opens, you flip it, and it closes. All right, that's how time works. So as a note, Goers was the best maker of large format lenses at the time that this was made, and it was later absorbed by Zeiss into, uh, in a move by Zeiss to eliminate their primary competition. There were some other factors, but I'm sure that eliminating Goers' as competition was probably a very big one. So having used Goers and Zeiss lenses of the time when this camera was made, um, what I can say about the two companies from 100 years ago is this. Photographic lenses today would probably be far more advanced if Goers had survived. Uh, Goers made really amazing lenses. The 8x10 Goers that I have uh, is, is unbelievable. There's just no other way to, to put it. Anyway, um, the target market for this camera was the higher end amateur. It was a very simple to use camera. It was not a field camera or monorail. It wasn't something with an accordion. So we know that this was meant for amateurs, but it was a goer's camera, so it was meant for people who were higher end or at least had more money to spend on a camera. It's a box camera, sure, but it was made by goers, and the lens on it is by box standard cameras of 100 years ago. Quite good. This would have been a high-end alternative to Kodak, Ansco, and other cameras of the era, and a higher-end version of this camera that I've never seen before, but have seen a photo of, apparently came with an f6.8 ten I'm not sure how to pronounce this, but Tenexer, Tenexiar, or Calostigmatic lens with a Comper shutter, so basically an upgraded shutter and an improved lens. Production from this was by Goers, and we know it was Goers because it doesn't say Zeiss, as we've already, as we've already talked about. It was made in Berlin, Gym, Germany, from 1924 to 1926, so this camera is literally a century old as I record this video. So, we're going to go through this camera. If you have yours or just are curious about it, we're going to start here on the top. This is a handle. It's literally for, it's a metal handle. Like, this is the only box camera I've ever seen that doesn't have a, a leather handle on it. And it's used for carrying it around. Box Tangor, the model. Here is one of the two uh, snaps, literally looks like the kind of snaps off like your, your Levi's or something that holds the front of the camera in place. Viewfinder window up here. Aperture selection lever right here. Shutter speed selection lever on the side. And I'll show you how these work. Lift it up to select the aperture, just like that. There are, two, there are three different apertures on this camera. Or on this one, you lift it up to move it from, ball, uh, from instant rather to time mode. While we're here on the front of the camera, we have the viewfinder windows. This will allow you to see the scene through, through the top and side of the camera, the lens, and then this little mark that indicates something. It's actually really worn. I think that's who sold this camera, which store sold it, because it doesn't say goers on it. It says something, something in mains. It's in German. I've gotten enough comments from, Germ 
from my German viewers about my my pronunciation not to try that again on the fly. Uh, next here on this side, we have the film advance knob. This is where you would advance the film, right? Shutter lever right here and viewfinder. This shutter is a bit touchy. Did it just jam on me? Nope, there it goes. There we go. Okay, yeah, 100 year old shutter, still works, a little bit touchy. I think we can give it credit for that. This side has a whole lot of nothing. The back has the red window for counting your frames when you load the film. And the bottom has the second snap. On this one, it actually is shot. It doesn't, doesn't actually snap into place anymore. Might just be because that's bent. Anyway, and then three feet for setting this down on something to take a photo, you know, on the level. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about with this camera is how to load film. So to open it, you lift up both of these snaps and then you pull the back of the camera out like this. And we're gonna set it off to the side. Here you can see Goer's 10X film, uh, six by nine centimeters, and then um, some other information. I should actually be able to read that. It's not upside down. Oh, use Goer's 10X film. On this side, we have nothing. You can see here is this take-up spool. This, you need, to, with, the, with a 120 camera, you have to have a spool already in place. So this is already in place. This is what we're gonna use to take it up. If we had just finished a roll of film, it would be up here. We'd simply pull it out and mount it down there. This, this does not have any actual film in it, but it has the paper and that's what's important for this. To load the film, you just slide it onto that side there and clip it into place like that. We're gonna pull out a leader wrap it around and wrap it around. And then we're going to rotate the knob down here until we see a slit in the spool become visible. We're gonna feed this in and advance this just a little bit. There we go, until we get all of the slack out. Now, this is as far as, we, we could take this actually a little bit further. We could take the arrows as far as the edge here and we'd still be fine, but you don't want to take them very much further before you put the back of the camera back on. Clip the snaps, snap the, <laughs> click the snaps into place, and now look in the red window, and we're just going to start advancing the film. There's going to be a bunch of symbols in here, and this should advance very easily. If it's not smooth, you have a problem. You might be able to see those arrows there. That means we're starting to get close. And then there should be this indication is saying what type of film it is. And when we get to one, there we go. We're gonna center the number one in that window. And now there is film in the area of the negative, which is about the size of this outer ring. You can outer square rather. So that's how we load film. Take our first photo. If the shutter will actually fire, man, there we go. And after we take a photo, we advance the film until we get to number two. And you just keep repeating that process for all eight photos, I think it is, on 6x9. And uh, the way that this works is that the numbers for the frame are physically printed on the back backing paper of the film. So you can see this is 6x9 down here, 6x6, 6 645 for the three most common sizes. So these are the numbers that we're seeing through the red window, specifically this one in the middle. So if you have actual film, don't open up your camera with film loaded because film is one and done. It can record photons exactly one time. If I, were, if I had real film in here, every bit of film that is, that is from outside of the spools would have been erased instantly. So don't do that. I just want you to see kind of what happens as we advance the paper through the camera. You can see that as it turns, the the numbers advance. The higher the number gets, the fewer the turns are needed to advance it because the diameter of the take-up spool paper gets thicker. That's how you load film and advance it through the camera. I love how this camera is just falling apart on my desk as I do this video. It is a hundred years old, what can I say? All right, next thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how to use the viewfinders on this camera, which are right here and then on the side. This is your portrait orientation viewfinder. This is your landscape orientation viewfinder. So whichever way you're gonna take a photo, you use that viewfinder. 
All you do is sight up the scene in here. You have to hold your, your eye a couple of feet away from this. Like this, this is designed to be held at chest level or lower. Kind of eyeball the scene and just take your photo. If your viewfinder is completely filthy like this one was when I bought it, you can take it apart and kind of clean the glass. Do not clean the silver mirror under there. It's surface coated. It's very fragile. You will take the mirror coating right off of it. Uh, trust me on that. Not with this camera, but with another one of the same vintage, I took the mirror right off of it. So, uh, and had to order new mirrors for it. Anyway, um, just a word of advice if you do, do decide to try and take this apart to clean it. So, but that's it. That's very simple. All you have to do is sight up the image and then, then take it. To, to actually take the photo then, there we go. To actually take the photo, you trigger the shutter which is being touchy as all get out tonight on this camera. The way that the shutter works is that every time you flick it, it alternates. So if I was in instant mode, flicking this up takes a photo. Flicking it down takes a photo. If you lift this lever up, it puts you into time mode. So what you got to do for time is just flick it, and then the shutter will stay open until you put it back in the direction it came from. If I take it out of time mode and I trigger the shutter in instant, now I put it back into time mode. There we go. Pushing the shutter down, if I put it into time mode when the lever is up here, will then activate time mode, which I reset by lifting it up. So 1 of a second for instant, as long as you would like if you decide to use time. For apertures, all you have to do is lift this up. And let me see if I can show you what the apertures actually look like. Okay. So... If we look through the lens there with the light behind it, we can now see that's the largest aperture, medium aperture, smallest aperture. What I know about the apertures, so I could not find any indication of what the smaller two ones are. The largest is F9. It was this aperture system used the goers aperture system of the time, where F9 for goers was F9 for the actual aperture calculation system as we use them today. So since I'm a little bit familiar with the goers aperture system, I did some rough math and think that I figured out what the other two apertures were are. So if we lift this up, this would, should be goers 24 and this should be goers 32, which correspond in today's numbers to F16 and f22.6, we'll call it f22, um, for shooting. So that gives you a little bit of control over your aperture if you're out shooting. If you're using 100 ISO film on this, f9 might be a little bit fast, but f16 and f22 would probably get you within the film's tolerance for full sun daylight shooting. So we've gone over basically everything about the camera. We've talked about how to take a photo, how to do all the se other settings. What about double exposures? This is a double exposure machine. All you have to do is flick the, this, the shutter back and forth, and you can take as many exposures onto a piece of film as you want. The shutter mechanism and the film advance are not connected at all, so you can take double exposures very easily. You just don't have any real control, except for your aperture, over how you're going to take your double exposure. I do have some tips for using this camera to help you get the most out of it. The first is to have proper expectations for what it can do. It was okay when it was made, but that was a literal century ago. Keep in mind that your subjects need to be about two meters from the lens. So this is not a close-up camera, and it's designed for snapshots and travel photography. Basically, you want to have anything you take a photo of be seven feet or further from it. So, Also be careful cleaning the lens as it's old and soft optical glass of hundred years ago. It's very easy to scratch the optical glass that was used a century ago. So basically what you want to do to clean it is use some very soft tissue, lens tissue. I'm going to put a drop of lens cleaning fluid onto it. Didn't mean to actually get that on the camera. And then just gently dab at the lens, dry any residue, and that should get the fingerprint off that I put on earlier in the video. There are some things not to do with your camera. Number one is just don't leave it in your car. The heat could damage the covering, so it can age and all of that. Also, like it doesn't look spendy. 
You just don't want to risk it getting stolen. Don't let it get wet. That could cause this to rust and would absolutely ruin it. And just remember that your goers box Tangor 6x9 is a pre precision tool that is also quite venerable at this point, and it should be handled with a due amount of care and respect. As long as you take care of your camera, your camera will take care of you. Thank you everyone for watching, and I'll see you in whatever video comes next.